Hello and welcome to this video on the feminist perspective of society. Feminism should be understood as an umbrella term. Within feminism, there are many different feminisms. There are many different movements that have come about at different points in history. The aim of feminism is firstly to gain recognition for the idea that society is male dominated, that it is patriarchal. It aims to describe, explain and change the position of women within society, believing that women are subordinated to men. It is both a theory of women's subordination and a political movement. It wants to bring about change to bring about equality between the sexes so that society may improve and progress going forward. The first wave of feminism, as feminism is understood to have come forward in waves throughout history, appeared in the late 19th century with very famously, the movement known as the suffragettes and their campaign for the right to vote for women. It is worth saying, however, that at the same time, or just previous to the suffragettes, there had been another movement known as the suffragists, and this was led by Millicent Fawcett, who very recently had a statue erected of her in Parliament Square in London. The second wave of feminism emerged in the 1960s, although there's no specific date from when this could be said to have begun, and saw the movement go global. Previously, we had seen very sort of localised feminist movements in places like the UK and the United States. Since then, it has had a major influence on sociology, the mainstream of which it criticises for being mainstream. That is, it focuses on society from a male perspective. As said previously, there are many different feminisms that we are going to need to focus upon when we are understanding feminism as a general theory of society. We're going to be looking at the liberal and reformist perspective, the radical perspective, the Marxist perspective, the dual systems perspective, the difference or black perspective and the post-structural perspective. You will find that there are a number of similarities between these, but also a number of key differences. Beginning with the liberal and reformist feminist perspective, the key names we need to be aware of here are Mary Wollstonecraft, who very famously wrote The Vindication of the Rights of Women, putting forward the idea that was considered quite radical at the time that women may in fact be human beings and may therefore be deserving of rights. She was also the very famous mother also of Mary Shelley, who wrote Frankenstein. The other key name here is Emmeline Pankhurst, who was the leader of the Women's Social and Political Union, aka the Suffragettes. Liberalism is a political perspective. It is also a philosophical perspective and it is concerned with human and civil rights and the rights of the individual. Liberals believe that as a human being, we have inalienable rights, that by being born human, you are naturally endowed with certain rights. They believe all human beings should have equal rights, therefore, and so therefore this needs to apply to women as well as to men. Reformism is the idea that progress towards equal rights can be achieved through gradual reform. So to reform something is to change it, generally with a view to trying to improve it. You therefore do not need a revolution, whereas as we've seen previously, Marxists would argue if you want to bring about change in society, you're going to need a violent and bloody revolution. For reformists, they would say actually a more gradual evolutionary approach can be used instead. Liberal feminists, therefore, believe women can achieve gender equality through reform and have documented the extent of gender inequality and discrimination. So they're very good at going out, doing a pieces of research which show that women are being discriminated against, that they are not receiving their equal rights by virtue of being human beings, and therefore change needs to come about. And they often lobby through political channels to try and bring about this change. They use this to empower their arguments. In addition to therefore trying to bring about political change and change in the law, we also need to bring about cultural change, liberal feminists would argue. So liberal feminists want cultural change as traditional prejudices and stereotypes about gender are a barrier to equality. So often within patriarchal society, there are nonsense beliefs that people hold about women, things like women are overly emotional or women aren't able to focus on certain tasks and activities in the same way men can. And therefore, this is why they cannot be allowed to do certain jobs. Liberal feminists would say this is not simply not true, there is no evidence for it, and so therefore we need to challenge that and bring about change culturally as well as changes to the law. 
In terms of sex and gender, liberal feminists are very specific in their understanding of this language, and we need to make sure we understand this too. For liberal feminists, when we're using the term sex or referring to someone's sex, we're thinking about biology, so their physical bodies. Do they have a physically male body? Do they have a physically female body? And often the focus there would be upon uh, the genitalia of these individuals and which chromosomes they have. Whereas liberal feminists would argue that gender is something which is actually given to us upon birth, that we are assigned a gender and that this is socially constructed. So while sex is seen as fixed, gender differences vary over time and they vary from culture to culture because they are socially constructed. We as a society make them and modify them as we feel we need to. A good example could be that today there's often this idea that blue is a masculine colour and that pink is a feminine colour. But if we go back even just over 100 years, that wasn't the case at all. Instead, often pink was seen as kind of a hot emotional colour, which was for boys, whereas blue was kind of seen as a bland, emotionless colour, which was more for girls. What is considered the proper role for a woman in one culture may be looked down upon in another. And again, this is the idea that what it means to be a woman, to be female, to be assigned that particular gender, varies over time from culture to culture. So in the West, it's very normal for women to work and for women to drive. In other parts of the world, that may not necessarily be the truth. Furthermore, liberal feminists would argue that socialisation plays a key role in understanding inequality between the sexes in our society. Sexist attitudes and stereotypes are culturally constructed, they would argue, and are transmitted through socialisation. That is to say, no one is born a sexist or misogynist, but rather they are socialising to becoming one, we're taught to become one. Socialisation patterns must therefore be challenged, for example, by promoting female role models in the media, in the education system and in the home. Over time, this will produce that important cultural change that liberal feminists are looking for, and gender equality will become the norm. Liberal feminists see men and women as equally capable of performing the same roles, so therefore there is no reason why a man or woman cannot do exactly the same jobs, whether in the home or outside the home, in the world of work. Traditional gender roles prevent both genders from leading fulfilling lives, liberal feminists would argue. So this is where they begin to uh, explain that to an extent, patriarchy also holds back men or it also damages men. And in particular, there's been reference to the idea that men may suffer from an inability to talk about their emotions and therefore the mental health problems that can come about as a result as a product of the way patriarchy operates and causes men to believe they have to behave in a certain way. This is the closest in many regards to a almost consensus view that feminism becomes, because generally we would understand feminism as being a conflict approach. But here there appears to be an attempt by liberal feminists to say that we can make things better, we can improve things, that it's not all bad, things are getting better, but more change still needs to occur. So they see all the conflicts in our society, the conflict at the heart of patriarchy between men and women as being inherently solvable. Next, we need to consider radical feminism. Now, radical feminism takes up a lot of people's thought and um, discussion space in this particular area of debate, often because radical feminists put forward a number of key ideas which are considered, well, rather radical and often quite scary. And we need to make sure that we understand that for the most part, radical feminists form a minority of all feminists. Nonetheless, their ideas are very useful and very interesting. Key name here is Shulamith Firestone, who wrote a number of key works during the late 60s and 70s. So developed in the 1970s, the key concept here is once again patriarchy, the idea that society as we know it is dominated by men and men use society to dominate women. In order to break this down a little bit further, they would argue firstly that patriarchy is universal. Shulamith Firestone herself argued its roots were in women's biological capacities, that because women are able to have children and during the time in which they are bearing children and obviously going into labour also, they are vulnerable, they have tended to have to rely upon a male protector in the past. Moreover, they would argue that patriarchy is everywhere, so it doesn't just appear in one society, it's in all societies everywhere and has existed almost throughout all time, although there were some early matriarchal societies uh, that we could do some research on at a different point. Radical feminists would argue that patriarchy is fundamental, that it actually forms what we call the original conflict, that when men realise, and we're talking about here early men in early societies, realise their physical prowess vis-a-vis -vis women, they used it to dominate women and to enslave women. And so in that sense, it is the most basic form of social conflict. 
actually men are therefore women's enemy and this means all men because all men oppress women radical feminists would argue men particularly benefit from women's unpaid domestic labor so their work in the home and sexual services it's worth remembering that all tasks and activities that go on in the home and as part of a relationship in terms of the sexual aspect at the very least are all tasks which could to an extent carry a financial cost so you can pay someone to come in your home and to clean for you and to cook for you and men in reality can pay if they so wish although illegally so for people to have sex with them and so in that regards men actually get a very good deal when they have either a girlfriend or perhaps a wife who provides all these services for them for free so in that sense all men are enjoying the oppression of women even if they do not wittingly realize they are doing so Radical feminists would also argue that patriarchal oppression is direct and personal, that it exists both in the public and private sphere, that it exists in every woman's life, in all of their relationships with men, even the ones that appear to be quite nice or the ones that appear to love them. They would argue that the personal is political, that every time a woman lives, that every time a woman does something in her life that involves men or is in a relationship with men, that is actually a political relationship of uh, of a sort so as i said previously radical feminists would argue the personal is political and this is because all relationships involve a power dynamic they are therefore political if one person is dominating another so if we assume a heterosexual relationship between a man and a woman radical feminists would argue that men by virtue of being first class citizens and having power in patriarchy have more power than their wives and girlfriends and so therefore they will use that power to dominate their wife or girlfriend so the personal relationship is a political relationship personal relationships between the sexes are political as men dominate women through them Radical feminists look at how power is exercised by men, which is often through sexual and physical violence. So what we're seeing here is the idea that whilst most men are not physically violent towards their girlfriends or wives, or dare I say their sisters and mothers and so on also, and whilst most men will not engage in sexual violence and most men will not engage in rape, the threat never always spoken out loud of potential sexual violence or violence generally or rape is enough to maintain that power dynamic so that women are always slightly aware in the back of their minds that the men could do this to them and men are always slightly aware in the back of their minds that if it came to it they could overpower women and so in that sense this is what's going on in the minds of individuals who have been socialized into patriarchy Another example could be that often the fear of rape deters women from going out late at night. They often feel there's places they can't go or things they cannot do because men are going to be there and they may um, be putting themselves at risk of something um, undesirable happening in that regard. Radical feminists argue sexuality is socially constructed within patriarchy to focus on men's desires. A good example of this could be that if we look at the world of pornography, that often the way it is filmed, the way it's choreographed, is from the perspective of a man and the male gaze and therefore women are objectified and turn into sex objects and in a lesser extent we also see this more generally in advertising media how women's bodies will be used to advertise product products on the belief that really it's men that's going to buy them and men like looking at women so the question then becomes how are women going to achieve their liberation and here is where once again radical feminists perhaps draw a lot of criticism and also cause a lot of debate and this often tends to terrify people which is interesting if not also fascinating. Given that patriarchy and women's oppression are reproduced through personal and sexual relationships these must therefore be transformed radical feminists would argue to ensure women's freedom. This can be done in three ways. Firstly separatism. Women need to break apart from men, literally physically live apart from men in women only colonies and create a new female only society with a new culture of female independence you cannot reform patriarchy radical feminists would argue you can only destroy it and one of the quickest ways to destroy it is to separate yourself from it and watch it collapse on itself next consciousness raising or awareness raising women only groups around the world should act to spread the message for the need for collective action that groups need to go out and talk to women and say right we need to liberate ourselves we need to be the change that we want to see in the world only we can do this men are never going to give us freedom or, or equality finally political lesbianism if every heterosexual relationship 
ultimately means that women are having sex with their enemy, men who are oppressing them, they must therefore no longer have sex with their enemy. Therefore, what they must do is engage in political lesbianism. Now, whilst most radical feminists would argue and understand that does not mean that all these women will now actually be lesbians, political lesbianism is to say that it's an expression that whilst I still have sexual needs, therefore I'm going to go with women, I don't want to have sex with men because every single time I do, I'm actually sleeping with my enemy. So lesbianism in this regard is a non-oppressive form of sexuality that women can pursue, radical feminists would argue. Next, we must consider Marxist feminism. And if we have a good grasp of Marxism generally, you'll be able to apply it or merge it with feminism nice and simply. Key names here are Michelle Barrett and Juliet Mitchell. Marxist feminists see women's subordination as rooted in capitalism. It's part and parcel of the way capitalism operates. And although men may benefit from women's subordination generally across the social classes, the main beneficiary of women's subordination is the capitalist system itself. Women's subordination results from their primary role as an unpaid homemaker, which places them in a dependent economic position on their husbands or male partners. In terms of the functions for capitalism that women's subordination or women play, firstly, we have that women are or act as a reserve army of labour. Women are a source of cheap labour for employers, that is the bourgeoisie, they are hired and fired to suit the needs of capitalism, and they are treated this way because it is assumed their primary role is in the home. So only in extraordinary circumstances would they be allowed into the workplace. And once they're in the workplace, well, we can treat them as second class citizens or workers. They're not quite men, so therefore they get paid less. This is the logic of capitalism, Marxist feminists would argue. A good example of this would be during the First and Second World Wars, where when women were uh, drafted into the jobs that men had left in order to go fight the war, they were often paid less and then once the men returned from the war the expectation that women were going to just down their tools and go back to the uh, role of a housewife and as you can probably imagine women were unhappy with this. Secondly another function for capitalism that women perform or women's subordination performs is that they absorb male workers anger which otherwise would be directed at capitalism so here we have almost an example of if um, you know a male proletarian is being exploited by his boss he then comes home and he's upset, he's angry, and it may well be that he turns that upset and anger on his wife, either verbally, possibly physically. And whilst that is unbelievably undesirable, ultimately what happens is it will soothe his anger. And once he um, gets over this and he's able to return the next day to work rather than, say, turning up to his boss and saying, well, why are you paying me so little? Why are you working me so hard? So actually, when women are absorbing men's anger, which should instead be directed at capitalism because capitalism is the source of their exploitation, not women. Thirdly, women also reproduce the labour force by being able to have babies, by being able to have children. They literally are making the next generation of workers for the bourgeoisie to exploit. So that's another function they perform uh, or that women's subordination performs for capitalism. Because of these links, Marxist feminists would argue women's interests lie in the overthrow of capitalism. The only way women will be free is if they overthrow capitalism, hence revolution and then ultimately classless communism. Furthermore, Marxist feminists identify a number of key ideological factors which play a role in women's subordination under capitalism and how capitalism has shaped our society and shaped power relationships between men and women and therefore prevents change, prevents revolution, prevents classless communism. Firstly, we have the ideology or set of ideas of familism. Familism in our society presents to the domestic division of labour as natural and normal. The family is portrayed as the only way women can attain fulfilment. So often everything from the way our media operates, from the way we're socialised, sort of says to women or says to people in general that this is the way the world should be, that man should be breadwinner, woman should be homemaker, women's role is in the home, women you will only be happy if you're in the home having children and being a good wife, that actually there is no happiness for you if you decide to go into the world of work. And this is known as familism. So capitalism, in addition to familism, needs to be overthrown. We need to get rid of this idea that the only way a woman can find fulfilment is by having a heterosexual relationship, having children and being a housewife. Furthermore, Marxist feminists would challenge the role in our understanding of femininity and how it is socialised to little girls and ultimately young women and women later in life and the role of the unconscious. So ideas about femininity and the women's role are very powerful. They're taught to us from a very young age 
uh, they are very deeply lodged in the kind of common psyche or the collective psyche of women. And so therefore, it's going to take a long time to overcome this patriarchal ideology. But the way you do it is by firstly overthrowing capitalism, getting rid of that need for a power dynamic in terms of social classes. And then you can start to challenge familism. And then from that, we can challenge ideas of what femininity is and what women unconsciously believe they should be doing in order to be a good woman. Next, we must consider dual systems feminism. Key names here are Heidi Hartman and Sylvia Warby. Dual systems feminism combines radical and Marxist feminism. The two systems being referred to in the phrase dual systems are capitalism and patriarchy, hence the mixture of radical and Marxist feminism. Dual systems theorists see these systems as intertwined and forming patriarchal capitalism. So they are completely intertwined. They cannot be separated from each other. To understand women's subordination, we must look at women's position in the domestic division of labour and in paid work. The two systems reinforce each other. What this means is if you were to simply get rid of capitalism, say by having a revolution, patriarchy would continue to exist and patriarchy would probably regrow capitalism. In a sense, the opposite can also be said to be true. So you need to challenge both the systems at the same time and you need to defeat both the systems at the same time. However, it is worth recognising, dual systems feminists would argue, that these systems don't always agree with each other. They actually often disagree with each other because capitalism wants cheap, exploitable labour and there is no cheaper, exploit more exploitable labour than women. However, patriarchy wants to keep women in the domestic sphere. And so therefore, these two ideas are the opposite of each other. And yet somehow they find some way to work together. Hence why it's necessary to absolutely challenge both of them to overthrow both systems. And only then will women achieve equality and end their subordination. The next theory we need to consider is difference feminism, sometimes known as black feminism. Difference feminists do not see women as a homogenous group. This is to say that they do not see all women as being the same. So when we refer to women's subordination, this is actually problematic because we're lumping all women everywhere, all over the world, into the same category. There are, in fact, differences between women in terms of social class, ethnicity, sexuality, and so on, and all lead to a different experience of patriarchy. So what does this mean? Well, if you are a white middle class woman who is able bodied and straight, your experience of patriarchy will be very different than if you were, say, a black working class woman who was also disabled. Therefore, we need to emphasise and understand diversity amongst women if we're to understand how patriarchy operates. They therefore argue against contemporary feminist theory and their claim of universalism, that we can talk to all women everywhere. They would say that this is a false universalism. In reality, feminism, up until very recently in academia anyway, so in sociology more generally, has actually been about the experience of white Western, heterosexual, cisgendered, middle class women and not about the voices of minority groups. Therefore, uh, this is where we start to see different feminists talk about essentialism. They claim that liberal Marxists and radical feminists are essentialists, that they see all women as essentially the same and therefore exclude some women's experiences and voices. And again, this needs to be challenged. So in a sense, they're almost arguing that feminism itself has a bit of a problem that needs to be dealt with before it can try and challenge patriarchy appropriately. Next, we need to consider post-structuralist or post-modernist feminism. Somewhat different, somewhat more difficult to a certain extent. Key name here is Judith Butler. Post-structuralist feminism is concerned with what we call discourses. A discourse is a way of seeing or thinking or speaking about something. So everything in human society has a discourse because we see everything in a certain way or we think about it in a certain way or we speak about something in a certain way. And that is the discourse. The world is made up of many, often competing discourses. And this is where post-structures look at the power to define. So by enabling its users to define others in other ways, a discourse gives power to those over whom it defies. Within every discourse, you're going to have essentially a group who are empowered and a group who are unempowered. So the empowered group are those who control the discourse. They control how we understand certain things, how we see things, how we talk about things, how we think about things. In patriarchal society, within patriarchal discourse, 
What we've tended to find is more recently in the West, childbirth has been started to be think, thought of as a medical condition that needs to be treated and that therefore women are patients. And what this has tended to do is empower male doctors um, over, say, female midwives and over female pregnant women who are in labour to treat them as they see fit and to make diagnoses about their, if you will, illness, which, of course, we should understand that childbirth and labour are not, that being pregnant is a natural thing that occurs, and therefore to kind of medicalise it appears almost as if it's a power play. It's about some people having power to define it as such and others not. Here we see Enlightenment principles at play, uh, such as reason, humanity and progress, which are arguably part of the power knowledge discourse that empowers white, western, heterosexual, cisgendered, middle class men. So all of the sort of key principles that we see as being at the heart of our society are actually arguably there because men decided they were there and men decided they were important and they tend to give men power. Therefore... This needs to be combated, post-structuralist feminists would argue, with an anti-essentialist approach. That is, understanding that women are not a single entity who share the same essence. Once again, this sounds very similar to difference or black feminism because there is no universal womanhood. Instead, identities are constituted by different discourses which vary over times and culture. So again, what it means to be a woman within a patriarchal society in one part of the world will be very different from in other parts of the world. Therefore, we need a very nuanced approach to challenging patriarchy. It's going to be different all over the world and in different times. We can't have a one-size-fits-all approach. Even today, there are different discourses applied to women in the West versus the Middle East. So how women are challenging patriarchy in the Middle East, very different from how they're challenging it in the West. Post-structuralist feminism allows um, or enables feminists to deconstruct and analyse different discourses to reveal how they might subordinate women. So in many ways, it's a tool for understanding how discourses are used to empower men and to disempower women. It's very academic, this approach. It's very much something that we would see discussed more at an undergraduate level. But nonetheless, nonetheless this idea of the discourse, the way of looking at something being controlled by men, very much fits with more traditional views of patriarchy as, say, liberal or radical feminists might have. When it comes to evaluating feminism, we have sort of general evaluations and we have specific evaluations. Firstly, more radical feminist ideas of a male-free society or removing men from the reproduction process seem fairly extreme and fanciful. So the idea that women are going to separate themselves and form women-only colonies, that women are going to engage in political lesbianism, that women, for example, may cease to have sex with men and instead clone sperm so we don't even need men anymore, this all seems almost something out of sci-fi rather than something from real life. And most women don't desire to live apart from men, they simply want men to change their behaviours and for society to change. So radical feminist ideas do tend to be on the extreme end of things. The divisions between the different strands of feminism lead to a great deal of internal criticism, for example, of radical feminists by Marxist feminists and vice versa. So the issue here is actually feminism spends a lot of time what we call navel gazing, which is looking at itself, talking with itself or talking with other feminists and arguing between groups of feminists rather than actually dealing with the issues of patriarchy. And that seems problematic if its aim is to bring about social change. Some postmodernists would reject the whole idea of feminism as a meta-narrative of um, you know, women's subordination, women being disempowered. They would argue this is just one way of looking at the world and that many would argue that this is not true at all. And in fact, there are anti-feminist movements around the world, which are not necessarily movements which seek to promote male power. They simply do not feel that you know, feminism is necessary, perhaps in contemporary uh, times. Black feminists have argued that much, especially early feminist work, is focused on white middle class women and their concerns. Other criticisms have claimed that some feminist thought has also largely ignored other factors such as disability, age and sexual orientation. And again, this is why difference feminism is perhaps particularly popular at this point in the fourth wave of feminism, which has begun over the last 10 years or so. Furthermore, it could also be argued that their focus on women is itself not even handed and that issues relating to gender should also examine men and the concept of masculinity and this idea that actually men may suffer under patriarchy as well and that men can be allies in the fight against patriarchy. 
Some more traditional feminists would argue that that simply isn't possible, that men cannot be allies in that regard. There is also a rather hotly debated area within feminism right now around the role of um, transsexual men and women and where they fit in the movement or not, as the case may be. And this is something that in particular you may see talked about in contemporary media, in particular on social media online today. That's it. Thank you very much.